dear audience, I know that the title of my talk is Organized Love, but before talking about love, I will have to talk about hate, and actually for a good part of my talk. But before we get to that, let me tell you a secret. So normally when I introduce myself to people, I say that I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, or I say I'm a political activist, I'm a political commentator. But if we were all sincere, if I were brutally honest, and if you had asked me, Kubra, what is your real profession? I would have to say, I am an intellectual cleaning lady. So what I do is, basically, for the past 15 years, over half of my life, I have spent cleaning after racists and sexists and extremists and Islamophobists and Islamists and um, right-wing populists, extremists of all kind. And my story usually goes like this. They, the hateful and destructive people in our society, they blur out their nonsense, they pour their hate into the middle of our society, and then others wonder. They wonder if this actually might be true. Are black men really conditioned to be more violent and criminal than others? Are Muslims less intelligent than others? And shall we build a wall to protect ourselves from those violent refugees? I wish I could tell you that I just shrug my shoulders and completely ignore these debates, but as the dutiful intellectual cleaning lady I am, I show up and I clean. I react, I explain, I name the facts and I name the figures. I react, I react, I react, I react to the most absurd nonsense. But what I fail to recognize is that in the process, while I am cleaning after these people, in fact, what we have all failed to recognize is that those hateful people, those debates, they have dictated our lives. Our lives are dictated by the hateful. They force us to answer their questions. Our TV shows, our talk shows, our radio shows, newspapers are filled with their questions and we take our time and we try to answer them. We clean up after them, explaining them even the most absurd things. And they distract us. Let me share a quote by Toni Morrison. The function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, so you spend 20 years proving you do. Someone says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Someone says that you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says that you have no kingdoms, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. There will always be one more pile of dirt to clean. One more destructive person to clean after. And for the past years, something had occupied my thoughts for a really long time. Hate. Hate on the internet. The internet flushes the ugliest face of our society to the surface. Hate that was previously only visible th to those directly affected now becomes visible to everyone. When a black man would walk down the street and experience hate, this short encounter between the hated and the hater, on the internet it becomes a constant moment. And that's a good thing because now we all can see what only some experience in our society. And now this might be an opportunity to create solutions altogether. But what we have failed to do is, as a society, we have failed to recognize that hate on the internet is real hate. And we have failed to sanction it. So what happened? Hate on the internet entered an echo chamber 
and it became louder and louder. It started to grow slowly but surely. It became bigger and bigger, larger and larger. It became organized to an extent that it was most radical, most extreme. The internet is not just a reflection of our society. The internet has now also become harbinger of what awaits us offline. Like what awaited my friend Fatma. She was walking down the street in Berlin when out of nowhere, all of a sudden, the stranger came up, came up, this complete stranger. And he punched her in the stomach violently. She fell down on the floor and he pretended as if nothing had happened and just went on. This happened twice within a few weeks span and her little children witnessed this. When she told me this, I was shocked. But I was more shocked to find out that this was not a coincidence. This was organized. This was planned. If you go on the internet on Facebook, you will find events where racist groups organize and set certain dates. And they ask people to violently attack black and Muslim women on the streets because they have a very violent but silent message. You are not welcome in this society. You are not welcome in this country. Hate on the internet is organized. It is most extreme, most violent. It has come to an extent where people think that soon there will be a civil war in Germany and they prepare for that. To the extent where people think it's okay to put refugee shelters on fire. To an extent where people blow themselves and others up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry for all the fear-mongering, but now you might get an idea of what an average day in the life of an intellectual cleaning lady looks like. So let me take you back to a few months ago when I completely lost any idea, when, I, when my mind completely went blank. Um, I was sitting in the office of the editor-in-chief of a large German newspaper and we were discussing some upcoming projects and I had sent him a few texts in advance and he printed them out and, and then when I was in his office he told me, Kibra, in your text, why are you shouting? <laughs> At first I was startled, I didn't know what he meant, but soon I realized what he was trying to say. Yes, I was shouting. I was shouting for the past years because I wanted people to hear what I hear. I wanted them to see what I see. I wanted them to feel what I feel. But I didn't see society. I didn't look at society as a whole. I always kept looking at the most hateful people, most destructive people in our society. I kept responding to them. I was shouting while I was responding to them. And I asked myself, how would I talk like if these people didn't exist? What would I talk about if these debates didn't exist? What would I think? What would I write? And in that moment, in that office, honestly, I had no idea. I had no idea what I would do. My mind just went completely blank. I had wasted so much precious time cleaning up after these people. And in the process, while I was cleaning, somewhere in the process, I had lost my own voice. I had lost my own narrative. And sadly, I'm not alone with this. A whole generation of young people, blacks and Muslims and Jews and LGBTQ and people of color, we all have degenerated into public relations offices of our respective communities. We have become spokesperson of our communities, responding to everything that is being directed at us. That's how we all became intellectual cleaners. So let's get back to that office where my mind went completely blank. What the editor-in-chief actually did is he pushed me into an existential crisis. <laughs> Actually, a good one, though, because I realized 
I just can't stand being an intellectual cleaner anymore. Never before did it feel so demeaning, so belittling, so hurtful. And I decided, goodbye, dutiful cleaning lady. Hello, world. Now it's my turn to make a mess. Don't worry, I haven't joined the dark side just yet. <laughs> But I've decided to stick to my own narrative, to stick to what I believe in. If I react, I'm going to react on my own terms. In fact, that's what we should all do. Just because I stopped cleaning, it doesn't mean that hate is gone. Hate is going to exist continuously offline and online. But we have the power to choose how we respond to that. We have the power to decide what our public agenda is. We have the power to decide what our own narrative is. Hell yes, I'm scared. Hell yes, I'm worried. Not a single day passes by without a friend calling me and telling me that they want to leave the country because they just can't stand it anymore. But I chose to remain hopeful. I chose to suggest that we should radically rethink the way in which we interact with each other. Let us radically rethink the ways in which we treat each other. I suggest, let's organize love. Because silence in the face of hatred is approval. Because freedom, justice, and peaceful coexistence, none of these things are God-given. Because those have to be fought for. This is why we need to organize love. Loving and supporting each other in the face of hatred becomes an act of political action, an act of political protest. And many people ask me, Kubra, how do you actually organize love? And, and to be honest, I don't have the formula. It is something we have to do as a collective. We all need to try and organize love. The only thing I can offer you are three little steps that each and every one of you can do. A starting point, a way to start organizing love. Number one, let's show affection, appreciation and support. Ask yourself, how do you treat people who have the very same values as you do? Do you support them? Or do you scan their work until you find a mistake to point that out and adorn yourself with a critique? I'm not asking to ignore flaws. I'm not asking to ignore disagreement. I'm just asking you, be as driven by support and appreciation and agreement as you are by anger. Let us digitally perform our applause, our appreciation, our support for each other. Let us be bold and proud about appreciating one another. Let us say it out loud. I like your work. Thank you. I like your comment. I like your article. I like what you do on a daily basis. I like you. Number two, let's have some pathetic arguments. I'm not advocating for a rainbow world full of unicorns and adorable cat content and endlessly smiling emojis where every trace of anger or disagreement is suppressed. I'm not advocating for the dictatorship of love, although I understand that it might be appealing to some. What I'm actually advocating for is, let's argue. Let's have arguments. But let's have sympathetic arguments. Let us create spaces in which we can be vulnerable, spaces in which we can do mistakes, be flawed, and grow and learn, spaces in which we learn from one another, listen to one another. And those spaces can be anywhere, in your living room, in cafes and restaurants. They can be at town halls. They can be on the internet, on forums and chat groups. Let us create those spaces, and in those spaces, let us listen to each other. Number three, 
Let's push our own agenda. Let us be radical. Let's be radical in our ideas for the future. How do we want to live together? Let's really think through this. How do we want to live together? How are we going to overcome the many obstacles that we're going to face, surely, in the future? And now, let's create a vision, and let's push that vision. Because pushing our own agenda will empower us, and it will emancipate us from distraction and hate. It will allow us to dictate ourselves our days, our work, our life, our public agenda. Let us push our agenda. Let's have a vision. Last point. Actually, I really struggled preparing this talk because last time I did it, I cried. So this time I was like, no crying. <laughs> but another reason was that I felt ashamed. I felt ashamed of proposing something so simple, like basic, maybe pathetic or naive to some, something like organizing love. It took me weeks and months, but now I embrace it. In the last couple of weeks, I have come to embrace this. I have come to embrace this idea. This is my narrative. My narrative is the narrative of love. And actually, I'm hopeful for the future, because I know we will make a mess, a beautiful mess, a colorful mess, a loving mess, a mess full of love that no one needs to clean after. Thank you. <laughs>